continue our study in Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 17 and following. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have given us your word today to study and to devour, because it is the bread of life. It is that sustenance for us. That, Lord, we are to live from every word that proceeds from your mouth. And we know that the Bible is your word given to us, revealed to us. Lord, preserved by your guarding spirit to bring the message of hope and redemption. To bring it to a lost and broken world. And I pray that today that our broken and humbled hearts would be able to receive the things that you are teaching us and that we might be encouraged and built up, strengthened, Lord, for the days ahead. And that, Father, we might find freedom from guilt and shame and condemnation. That, Lord, the burden of sin might be lifted in Christ. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so far in our study... Paul has addressed the promulgation of a false gospel among the Galatian churches. He argues that the gospel that he preached and his calling as an apostle were both received directly from Jesus. He demonstrates this by summarizing his limited contact after his conversion with the apostles in Jerusalem. And he makes it clear that he did not receive his apostolic commission from them and was not taught the gospel by them. Not only that, when Peter began to compromise on the gospel, Paul confronted him face to face, demonstrating that Paul was neither inferior to Peter nor compromised towards the gospel that he preached. And in confronting Peter, Paul makes the point that even the Jewish Christians who had the law recognized they were not justified by the works of the law and had believed on Jesus for salvation. Put otherwise... If the Torah or the law could have produced righteousness before God, why should anyone have turned from Judaism to Jesus in the first place? Now, our passage today follows up on uh, all of this. Um, and I would just kind of want to refresh our memories by reading the, the preceding portion. Galatians 2, chapter 14, I mean, uh, Galatians 2, verse 14 says, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manners, manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Another one of those days. Ah, I'd be ready for the, I I thought this, this, all this rain and stuff would blow out the Sahara Desert uh, dust. Uh Uh-uh. Dust and dander are still at 100%. So, anyways, so for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So let's begin our exposition of the passage at hand, Galatians 2.17. And the first thing we're going to see is that the the law brings condemnations, condemned by the law. Uh, So, 
Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is, there, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now let me say at this point that Paul is clearly addressing either real or hypothetical objections that can be made against his position and his argumentation. Now, without knowing exactly what his opponents were saying, or if it's Peter responding, what Peter was saying, it's difficult to determine exactly what Paul's meaning is. What is he, exa- what is he addressing? So this is a very difficult passage to interpret. And man, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, on uh, uh, Friday, I got bogged down in this passage, and I, I spent three hours, after I had already done all my studies, and I started putting all this together, and I went, I don't understand this. <laughs> I got to go back and restudy some of this and look at it. And I, man, I had, I had a sermon. Woo, it was in depth going through all of that. And I was like, I just can't do it. Cause I, no, actually, I called up Danea. And I, and I was talking to her. I said, man, I'm stuck. I'm going to be a little bit later than I thought. I'm stuck on this passage. And I started explaining to her. And she goes, skip it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good advice <laughs> well I can't just skip it but I can throw you throw out there some of the, the problems in the text okay but if while we seek to be justified by Christ we ourselves are also found sinners who are found sinners well Paul has been talking to Peter and he begins to use the, the plural we and he refer- references himself as, you know, we Jews. So I think he's still talking to, uh, talking about the Jews seeking to be justified by Christ. Even we. So I think I got that part. I think it's uh, while we Jews seek to be justif- justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Now, how are they found sinners? That's the, that's the, the struggle here. By the men come from James who were complaining about them, about Peter uh, eating with these Gentiles? Is that who found them to be sinners? Or were they found sinners by suddenly committing new sins since they are no longer under the law? Uh, that's the way a lot of people take it. Uh, they, they think that this is about, uh, uh, you know, suddenly the law is gone so you can go out and just do whatever you want, that kind of mentality. Or... Is this being found sinners by having their sins laid bare so that they now recognize their true status as sinners just like the Gentiles? Now there's much to commend this option, especially considering the seemingly paradoxical nature of what transpires in the gospel. Think about this. Sinful Gentiles are declared righteous while seemingly righteous Jews are declared sinners. You know, there's kind of a role reversal here. But really, Paul says elsewhere that all are brought under sin, right? All are brought under the condemnation of the law. That the word of God has confined everyone under sin. The, then, so, yeah, I can kind of get that. But then he's, you know, he says, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Whatever he's talking about, being found sinners... The question arises, is Christ then for, therefore a minister of sin? Has he increased sin? Well, what, what's, how is that possible? Is it because the, 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 that grace is now promoting licentiousness? In other words, I'm saved outside of the law. I can go out and do what I want. I told you, I've met a guy like that. Said he can do whatever he wants because he's under grace. I told him he doesn't know what grace is. Titus says that, that the grace of God has appeared teaching us that denying ungodliness, we should live righteously. It doesn't say we can go out and do whatever we want. Is that, what, is that what's happening? Is that how Christ is claimed to be a minister of sin? That, that because you're not seeking the law, you can just go out and do what you want? I don't think that's what, that's, that what this text is about. Paul addresses that very objection over in Romans. People accuse him of teaching grace so you can just go out and sin. And he said, no, 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 no. 
Another option is that this is really increasing the amount of sinners in the world. This is a serious objection or a serious uh, scholarly point. They think that, okay, and this is really kind of ridiculous to me. They think that the argument against uh, Paul's position is that, well, if Jews suddenly figure out that they're a bunch of sinners, well, now the world's full of a whole bunch more sin- a, a whole lot more sinners than it used to be because all these Jews have now figured out they're sinners. And so Jesus has actually increased the amount of sinners in the world. Well, what's the problem with that logic? They're already sinners. They just didn't know it. <laughs> you know? It's not about you know, making them sinners. It's about declaring them sinners or, or exposing them as sin. Another option that the scholars look at that, that is an objection that Paul is addressing is that Jesus has become a minister, minister of sin by teaching the Jews to abandon the law. And this might be what's going on. After all, Jesus did declare all clean, foods clean, and he did some things that, that seemed to be contrary to the law, allowed them to pluck grain in, on the Sabbath and that kind of stuff, seemed to be contrary to the law. Are they arguing, are, are Paul's opponents arguing that, that Jesus is teaching his followers to abandon the law, therefore increasing sin? That's probably kind of along the lines of what we're talking about here. It has something to do with the law, obviously. But whatever it is, whatever the problem that he is addressing, it gets his strongest denunciation. Certainly not. God forbid. Man, never be. And then now I think we begin to get a clue as to what Paul is talking about because he says, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Except that, what are the things that he began to destroy? (laughs) What is he building again? There's two options here, too. Some argue that Paul is now talking about his personal experience because he switches from the we to the I. So we seek to be justified. We're found sinners For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Some argue that Paul is now talking about his personal experience of tearing down the church. Building it up again demonstrates that that he was actually a sinner when doing so. Again, this this to me just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, he did tear down the church. Yes, he persecuted the church. But it doesn't fit the context to me. It doesn't fit the context of the next part of the passage. And I don't... See, here's the problem. When he begins to speak in the first person singular, is he talking about his personal experience or is he now speaking representatively? He spoke representatively uh, about the Jews. And now is he transitioning to speak representatively from the Jew and Gentile position. I think that's probably more the case. In fact, most commentators think that what is being built up again is the law. And that doing so results in the law bringing back condemnation. Campbell says, If a believer would return to the law after trusting Christ alone for salvation, that law would only demonstrate that he was a sinner, a lawbreaker. Now, this is what Paul means, and it illumines verse 18. By rebuilding the law, Peter had exposed himself to be a sinner and brought forth condemnation on himself. So let me take a minute to kind of gather all this together. A lot of ifs and whats and all that stuff. Now, what is the problem being addressed? Peter separating himself from the Gentiles. In other words... Trying to observe the law. But Peter has already been, in fact, is the initiator through Christ of the gospel going to the Gentiles. Of setting aside the law for the sake of the Gentiles, if you will. So, that's really the root problem here. 
The law is the problem. Observance of the law is the problem. Whatever Paul is addressing, it has to be that. It has to be that issue. Now, what's wrong with the law? Paul argues in Romans that the law is good, right? Do you think God gave us a bad law? Ten Commandments are good, right? Yeah. I mean, what's wrong with them? There's something wrong with the Ten Commandments. There's a fatal flaw in the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. It's powerless. There's no power in it. In the law that it was weak through the flesh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. What, 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 well, let me just go read it. Now, the law is not, Paul said the law is good. It's great. It's wonderful. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing bad about it. It's not evil. It's good. It was meant for my good. It's meant for a blessing. But Romans 8, well, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The law could not do it. Now, I want to command every one of you to fly. Not by using Southwest Airlines, but by flapping your wings. Well, one, you ain't got any wings. But you can strap some wings on, so get to flapping. I command it. You got to do it. Anybody want to try? Well, when you were a kid, you tried, remember? <laughs> Getting on the roof and jumping off and trying to fly and all that stuff. Am I the only one? You know, I wasn't fat back then, and I could do that kind of stuff. That's probably why I had bad knees, dumb stuff like that. I had brothers. Yeah, you had brothers. <laughs> my, one of my favorite cartoons is Calvin and Hobbes when he's about to jump off the roof, and his mom's coming out the door. No! <laughs> he's going to fly. Well, you can't. I, don't, I can command you all day long. And you can't. My command doesn't enable you to do it. You know what? God just telling you what to do does not enable you to, enable you to do it. The command is good. In fact, if you could fly, boy, wouldn't it be so much easier? That'd be a good thing, right? But you can't. And my commandment has a fatal flaw. It's commanding you to do something that you're not able to do. Now, it's not that you're not able, completely unable. It's that you're unwilling. The flesh is weak. That's, the, that's what the text says. The law is uh, uh, um, failed to do it because, we're, because of the weakness of the flesh. Our inability to perform the law in totality. Sure, we can keep some times, you know, we can keep law. Do we lie every word we speak? Can you speak the truth? Yeah. No, sure you can. Do you always speak the truth? No. It's, see, there's weakness there, not total inability. Now, it doesn't mean that you're ever going to be sinless, obviously. No one could ever keep the law. And so this is the problem. The problem is I cannot obey it. So God's got to do something about it. He's got to change the program. Now, that was never really the program anyways. The law wasn't there to save us. It was there to teach us that we needed to be saved. Right? And so Paul continues on. In verse 19. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. <clears throat> I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Amen. Now in these verses, Paul takes up another major objection to his doctrine of justification by faith. 
by denigrating the law as the proper channel for a right standing before God, had not Paul undermined the very basis for living a righteous life? Did not Moses command the children of Israel to walk in God's ways, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws in order to live? See, man, I set before you life and death. Choose life. How, do they, how are they supposed to choose life? By obeying God. To choose to disobey is to choose death. Why? Romans 8 is the law of sin and death. If you sin, you die. Period. Everybody. So, Paul's opponents, they may have understood the need for being justified through Jesus, but they're missing the point on how to live in Jesus. Because they might have agreed that the gospel had gone to these Gentiles. These Gentiles could be saved without the law. They didn't have to get circumcised to be saved. Now, that was a problem early on in the, in the, in the text that we've been looking at. But in this instance, it's just about fellowship. So they may agree that, well, they could be saved, but you can't hang out with them. You can't eat with them. And Peter got caught up in that. And so Paul's rebuke is about how to live the Christian life. And the reason why he has a strong rebuke, because it doesn't just affect how he lived the Christian life. It affects how you get saved when you don't live the way that you're supposed to live according to Christ. That'll, be a, that'll make a little bit more sense as we go through this. See, similar, similar objections to Pauline theology have come up throughout history. In the 16th century, Duke George at Saxony sum, summed up his protest with his comment on Luther's doctrine. Luther's doctrine that you're justified by faith alone through grace alone, you know, so forth and so on. And uh, Duke George said this, it's a great doctrine to die by, but a lousy one to live with. Now, what's he mean? Well, he thinks the same thing that, that Paul's opponents do. Well, if you don't have the law, you're just going to go out and sin. You're just going to go out and do all kinds of bad things. See, this is why I believe that Galatians is not really about justification as much as it is sanctification. The issue at hand wasn't about how you get saved. Now, it affected that. It impacted that. But Peter wasn't telling the Gentiles you're not saved verbally, but he's kind of doing it by how he lived. And so it's really about sanctification. But notice what he says. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. Paul has died to the law through the law. Now, He's been freed from the law. He is, he is talking about how he has died to it. Now, why? Because Peter and the others, they still seem to believe that it has some hold on them. They still believe some way that the law has a hold on them. Even though Peter has been living as a Gentile ever since that great day when the cloud, uh, the, the cloud, the, uh, the, what do you call that thing? Sheep come down from heaven and was filled with all the unclean animals, and God tells him to eat. Ever since then, he's been eating Big Macs and, you know, whatever he can, you know, bacon and, you know, whatever these old Gentiles were eating. Uh, you know, uh, when you go to, uh, by the way, when you go to Israel and you go to a kosher place, you can get McDonald's, but it doesn't have any cheese on it. It's like, man, McDonald's is far better over there, by the way, than it is over here. <laughs> That's much better in Israel. But anyways, uh, so, you know, they could eat what they wanted. There wasn't any restriction. Peter was eating what he wanted, hanging out with them, and all of a sudden, these guys show up with the law. And for whatever reason, Peter succumbs. And Paul says, man, you're dead to that. You're dead to that. In fact, that's the only way this could work. See, the law has to execute the death penalty. And once it has, there is no more jurisdiction over the one that's been executed. We don't go dig up criminals and kill them again. Once they've been executed, that's it. It's over with. 
You know? There's no double jeopardy when the person's dead. And that's what Paul says. I, through the law, died to the law. Now, how's that happen? Well, Romans chapter 7, verse 1 says this. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is freed from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another to him who was, ra- who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Now, what does Paul mean here to die? Well, elsewhere, he uses this expression, not only with reference to the law, but also in relation to self, sin, and the world. And in each of these cases, he means that this re- his relationship to these entities, self, sin, and the world, law, that these have been so decisively altered by his union with Christ, that they no longer control or dominate or define his existence. In other words, he points to his union with Christ as the reason why he has died to these things, died to the law, died to self, died to sin, died to the world. Well, how's that work? Through the body of Christ. And that's why Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. The very person I was in my old life has been slain. The death penalty has come against me. Well, wait, I'm still walking around alive. How did that happen? By my union with Christ. By being united with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? Death. Death. Oh, So, I'm not just baptized into his life. No, you're first baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. When you come to Jesus, I'll never forget. I I was talking to a guy, trying to share the gospel with him, work with him at at work. And, and, you know, one day he said, man, I sure wish you partied. And I told him, I said, I sure wish you'd get saved. (laughs) You know, and one day he's like, well, maybe one day. And then, and then, but I was sharing the gospel with him, and he's like, man, that means I'd have to die. And I was like, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The person you are has to die, and you die in Christ. You're crucified with him. That old person's gone. Gone. Now, I want you to think about this. God made this clear to me one day when I was contemplating a near-death experience of mine. And God said, you know, if I hadn't wanted you, I'd have let you die right then. So that old guy's gone. He doesn't exist anymore. You're the new guy that I created, the new Kurt, the new creation. In fact, Revelation says that we have a new name given to us that no one else knows. Only God. When do you think we got that name? The instant we're born again. He names us with a new name. Why? Why? Because we're a new person. We're a new creation. We are born again. What's the first thing you do when you have a baby? You give it a name. You know, it becomes a food. You might think, you might have the name thought out. But boy, people at the last instant sometimes change their name. Turn over a bedpan and read some weird word on it. and Oh, that's my baby. You know, heard stories like that. That's insane. (laughs) Some name of the bed, the name of the bedpan on there, you know. You name your baby when the baby's born. It's a new person. God named you at your new birth. And he hasn't told the devil what your name is. He hasn't told you either because you'd blab it to the devil. So God is watching over you as a totally new creation. Someone that never existed before your salvation. You've been crucified with Christ. You were united in his death. And the law 
smote Jesus, right? The law slew him. You know, I, I have trouble with that song that says by, you know, that he was by darkness slain. And I used to, wouldn't sing that. And I'd sing, no, he was by God he was slain. God killed Jesus. The law did. But yes, I understand. I, I, I backed off that. Okay, yeah, darkness was involved. The devil was involved. And the devil thought he was winning. And, and of course, God brought the victory out of that. So I struggled with that. But the point is that it was the law that slew Jesus. He died on our behalf. And the law said, Guilty. And whose guilt was on Christ? It was ours. The law had said that we were guilty. We deserve to die. We're the ones that stood under guilt and shame. And Jesus said, I'll take that verdict and I'll take it for you. I'll take your guilty verdict and I'll give you my righteous, innocent verdict, my not guilty verdict. And so when we are united in Christ's death, we die the death penalty of the law. And guess what? Once it's removed, it no longer has power over us. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So we walk in the newness of life. For if, we have been, for if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. No longer slaves of sin. It isn't about, oh, I get some grace, so I go out and do all the sin and I want. That just leaves you a slave. It's about freedom. Freedom from sin. I didn't, I didn't come to Christ so I could stay a drunk. I came to Christ to be freed from it. You know what? You weren't saved so that you could continue to be unloving to one another. You're free from that. You don't have to be obnoxious and, and bitter and angry and selfish and, uh, you know, all these things. You're free from that in Christ. And if you weren't, the law would condemn you and say you're rotten and selfish and, <laughs> and all those evil things. And you'd be condemned and subject to guilt, but you're dead in Christ. The law no longer has dominion over you. It can no longer condemn you. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. What can condemn you? He, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who justifies. Think about it. The very one who could condemn you. The only one. Remember the woman in the well? Not the well, the woman in the well. <laughs> the, not even the woman in the well. The woman caught in adultery, brought before Jesus, and everybody's, you know, oh, what are you going to do with her? And he writes in the sand, and, you know, and he finally says, he who is without sin casts the first stone, and they all leave, and she says, or he says, uh, woman, where are your accusers? And, and they've all gone. Well, neither do I accuse you. He was the only one there that could pick up the rock and, and carry out his principle, he who is without sin casts a first stone. He could have picked it up and nailed her and been perfectly just. But instead of doing that, what did he do for her? He died for her. He went to the cross for her. Who is it who condemns? The devil can't condemn you. He doesn't even know your name. You can't. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You can walk free. Not to go sin more, but to be freed from sin. Not to be slaves any longer. There's no longer then I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ lives in me. 
It's not, it's not me that's alive anymore. That old guy's gone. The new life that I have is Christ living it out in me. The, the most profound thing I can remember, I'm driving in my car and I'm listening to some preacher on the radio. Or I'm riding, it seems like I'm riding in the car with somebody. And I can remember the first time I ever heard this, this concept that basically Jesus didn't call me to require me to live the Christian life. He wanted to live it through me. You know, everybody says the Christian life is just too hard. Sure, if you're doing it of your own power, your own strength. But if you're letting God live the Christian life in you, there ain't nothing hard about it. He's doing it. If you're focused on Christ living in you and not trying to live it yourself, it's not hard. See, Colossians 2.13 says, And you, all of us, being dead in your trespasses. You were dead in your sins. That means you're separated from God. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, you're talking about Gentiles, he has made alive together with him, with Jesus. When he raised Jesus, he raised you. He made you alive, having forgiven you all trespasses. And think, listen to this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. What's he talking about there? The law. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Why is it contrary to me? When is the speed limit contrary to me? When I'm speeding. <laughs> when is the law contrary to me? When I'm breaking it. The law was good, but it was contrary to me because I'm a lawbreaker. He has taken it out of the way. He's taken it out of the way. He's removed it. You know, back in the day, there used to not be speed limits in uh, certain areas of like Utah or places out there where there's open stretches of highway. There may still not be. You know, you don't get a ticket for speeding out there because there wasn't any speed limits. It's just straight narrow road. There's not much danger there except for hitting a buffalo. But you're foolish if you're going to drive fast enough that you can't stop if a buffalo walks out there. You know, the law was meant to protect you from self-destruction. It was meant to save you from, from destroying yourself until you could come to Christ. And we'll look at that later in Galatians. But, but the point is that it's been disarmed because it was contrary to us. Because guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work, it, not because it wasn't good, not because it wasn't right, but because I was being destroyed by it, by my ability to live it. It didn't protect me. It brought me under death. 3,000 people died the day the law was given. It brought them under death. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And I live by faith. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now think about what he's saying here. The life which I now live in the flesh, in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God. See, remember Paul had said that he died to the law that he might live to God? 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died, who's the one? Jesus. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That's what God is calling us to, to understand that we've been crucified in Christ and we have a new life in Christ, that we might live for him. And living for him is not living for sin. And we do this, we live this way by faith in the Son of God. Now, there's two ways of understanding this Greek construction here. It's a, it's a, 
the 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 concept is a um, oh, I can't the, the word just the, leaves me. Um, it's accusative uh, genitive. <laughs> I couldn't think of the the genitive case could mean I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God or the faith of the Son of God. It's one legitimate way of interpreting it. Or I live by faith in the Son of God. It's my faith in Him, or it's His faith or faithfulness. It can be translated either way. I take by faith in the Son of God. Uh, I take it, it's, 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 it's my faith in Him. There's a lot of reasons for that I won't go into. Um, the point is, not only are we justified by faith, but we also live by faith. This means... That the saving, that saving faith cannot be reduced to a one-time decision or event in the past. It's a living, dynamic reality permeating every aspect of our life. Uh, it's not just pray a prayer. Yes, you pray a prayer, you call upon the name of the Lord, and you're saved. You don't just teach people to pray a prayer because they can just pray a prayer. They can just you know, recite a prayer. That would mean nothing. It's dynamic reality, and it's something we live by. This idea is expressed in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. From faith into faith, or out of faith to faith. It's an idiom that begins, and it's something that begins and continues to the end. And we must give full weight here to the meaning of Paul's words. Think about this. Being crucified with Christ implies a radical transformation within the believer. You have not been called to self-reformation. Remember Jesus told the parable about the demon that left and, and comes back and the guy swept his house clean and it's all nice and he goes, ah, I got a nice new clean home to live in. I'll go get seven more and we'll make, you know, and his last state was worse than his first. Self-reformation doesn't work. It's about transformation, radical transformation. The I who has died to the law no longer lives. Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit dwells within, sanctifying our bodies as the temples of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to, to approach God's throne in prayer. There's God's symbol for me to, or sign for me to hurry up. <laughs> Y'all won't be able to hear me now. Think about this. We have been freed from the law. Galatians 2.21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. This is a shocking point, guys. Think about this. If we return to the law, we are setting aside God's grace, thereby making the cross of Christ completely pointless. Do you understand what legalism is saying? Those who try to return to the law, it's saying that Jesus died for nothing. Nothing. It totally invalidates the cross. Peter, not intentionally, but by his actions, was nullifying the cross. Well, those Gentiles... Well, they really weren't saved after all. The, the, Jesus didn't do enough for them on the cross. We can't eat with those guys. Legalism is blasphemy. It really is. It's an affront to everything that Christ did on the cross. So we should, in our application, first of all, reject legalism. Paul says this in Corinthians in uh, Colossians 2:16 says so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or sabbath which are a shadow of things to come. Think about that. Now what is he talking about regarding a festival or a new moon or sabbath? He's talking about the Jewish law, the ceremonial laws. 
it's getting, it's a big thing these days to go and do the festivals and observe all these things. And he says, let no one judge you in these things. And food or drink, what does he mean? Don't let anybody judge you. Don't let them make you feel guilty because you don't participate. You don't have to. See, the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you die with Christ in the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility and the ne neglect of the body, but they are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh." All those religious observances will not stop you from sinning. <laughs> well, they won't help. What you need is Christ in you. And once you have Christ in you, then you walk by faith. Colossians 2.6 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive him? By what? Faith. By faith. So walk in him. And the same way that you receive Christ you walk in him. So I've got a sin problem. How am I going to overcome my sin problem? Well, I just need to make myself a set of rules and regulations and that'll do it, right? I can say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And that ain't stopping me. <laughs> Danae can set up rules and regulations for me. That still ain't going to stop me if I really want to sin. What's going to do it? How am I going to overcome? By walking in faith. In other words, believing God's promise to enable me to overcome sin. That's it. Walking in faith. And then relying on Christ. Walking in faith means I, I keep trusting God's forgiveness and I keep trusting Him to cleanse me and I keep trusting Him to enable me. Colossians 1.27 to them, God willed to, known, uh, willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery to the saints, is what it says. To, to the saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Our hope of glory is Christ in us. If you don't have Christ in you, you don't have a hope of glory. If you have Christ in you, not only do you have the hope, you can live it out in this life. You can find victory over sin in this life because you have God's enabling grace. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we come to you and seek you, Lord. We seek you, Father, for your enabling grace, God. Father, we don't want to be slaves of sin. We don't want to be bound to sin. We know there are strongholds in our life. And God, sometimes we get worked up about a particular stronghold when you know that there's a, a bigger, deeper stronghold that has to be defeated first. And you are very strategic. And Lord, you begin to deal with us on our strongholds of sin. And I pray, God, that you would convict us of sin. Lord, if we're struggling with sins, strongholds deep within our hearts. Lord, if there's greed or lust or covetousness, Lord, or, or God, lying and deceiving and, and just doing all manner of evil things, Lord. If we're just selfish and dishonest, unloving, rebellious, whatever the stronghold of sin is in our life, Lord, I pray that you begin to conquer it by exposing it through the law, Lord. Teaching us what is contrary to you. Revealing the sin. Revealing our wickedness so that we could repent of it. Lord, not using the law as a means to establish our righteousness, but as a means to expose our sin. So that we can turn from it and turn to you and receive forgiveness. And receive salvation. 
And that we could continue to walk in that by faith, relying upon Christ who lives in our hearts. Lord, you have slain us in him and raised us to new life. God, enable us to live it out and walk in victory over our sins and our, the strongholds in our life, Lord. God, we want to be victorious. And we know the way, faith and the promises that you have made to us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.